Okay, so what we've been talking about so far, you can just put it on the tripod and oh. just position it so it can see me. And then I'm going to put this on YouTube for everybody Which? who's not. Can it? Okay, got it? Okay, now. All right, so what we've been talking about so far is that in the beginning of phase of your project in phase one, you're introducing activities. And just like we, I've said, the way you do that is with what you already know. You guys know how to do a theme. You know how to bring in books. You know how to do different kinds of activities to elicit children's interest. Najwa brought in a bunch of materials that she did, an excellent example of how to introduce your theme. Oh, look at all your books, Najwa. So she brought in, <laughs> look at all that. She brought in a costume and a book on buses and ambulance and fire engines and, and just put all these materials out and did a little bit of an activity where the children could build their own road and where they got to look at road maps. The one thing I really appreciated about what you did is you were kind of thoughtful about putting something in each learning center. Mm -hmm. So you had something at the literacy area. You had something at art and writing with the different street signs that you did. You had something in dramatic play with bringing in the steering wheel and bringing in the different, um, the costume. So you really kind of thought about this in terms of even learning centers, which is perfect. So when you guys are introducing your activity, think about how can I not only bring in materials but enrich different learning centers so that like with tools, I'm not just bringing in books about tools and bringing in a toolbox, but I'm also bringing in maybe um, an apron that you mm -hmm. could put your tools into. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing in, cool you know, books. you talked about the die cuts. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I'm bringing in measuring tape and I'm mm -hmm. bringing in like Rulers some, or paper like this, mm -hmm. where that could be your blueprint, mm -hmm. you know, and showing them how to roll that up. So you're bringing in different materials for different, different centers, okay? Mm -hmm. But now, I want you guys to think about how do I take it to the next level? Because I think that once we can, I, I can describe this process to you, um, it's really going to take away some of your anxiety about what happens next, okay? What happens next? All right, so once we have a topic, we're going to have hopefully some questions, and that's what we're doing with the web, right? Mm -hmm. We're laying out questions. Now, right now, the, whose questions do we have? Do we have the children's questions or our questions? Their questions, kind of. And one more thing about the tape. When it gets to, um, it can only take 15 minutes. I was on one, two. I know, so oh. when I get to, like, 12, turn it off. And then we have to restart it because YouTube will only let you upload up to 15 minutes. Okay. And my, my work study hates, you hate Laura, right? When we have to split the tape. <laughs> All right. Okay, so here we go. All right, so this, what I've laid out for you here is a description of what a learning activity or what a discovery-based learning activity would actually look like if you were doing it in the classroom with kids. And what I've done is I've actually written a sample in an explanation of what happened. So let's turn to the explanation first. Before we look at my sample, the sample will really kind of clear things up for you, okay? Let's look at the explanation. Okay, so the first box that you see, flip over Najwa to the second, and all this is available online in our class under curriculum materials, okay? So these are the phase two materials. So the first thing you see is a big blank box that says child interest or teacher interest, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because our project can come from either one, right? right. Flip, flip Najwa. Oh, sorry, okay. Right, see that first box is blank? Okay. Yeah, okay. And all that will go in there is the topic. That's it. So you maybe you're doing tools or building or you're doing cars. Whatever topic it is that you're investigating, just the topic. And I'll show you on the sample that I've just written the topic. My topic and my sample is snow. Okay? So the next thing, notice in this next box, you see where it says one and two? Mm -hmm. And then below it, it says one and two? Mm -hmm. What do you think that might mean? It's not we a typo. about the um, explore and investigate about that topic. Well, that mean? was the, the question to explore, and then the background research through hands-on. I guess it's after that they had the opportunity to do the hands-on experiences. I kind of struggled with this. What I was trying to show you is that this box, questions to explore, could be come first or it could come second. Second, okay. And that background research could come first or it could come, come second. second. Okay. And, and let me explain what I mean. What I'm trying to show you is that the questions that you come up with could be because you brought in all these materials on cars. And you're listening to the kids and you're watching the kids and the kids are really excited. So in that case, what, what came first would be box number two, background research. You're bringing in the materials first. Oh, okay. Sometimes, though, the question just happens because, like, the kids, like, with the example I'm going to give you, the kids are just doing something and all of a sudden they start asking you a question. Like, my idea of snow. The example I give you is snow. The, like snow right now, right? Mm -hmm. First big snowfall of the year, right? Happened last night. Mm -hmm. Kids go outside. They're excited about snow. They're excited about playing in the snow. So I, I'm trying to show you that, that with the project approach, things could happen either way. They could happen with you bringing in all the materials, 
they could also happen where the kids just naturally have a question that emerges. Now, because of the way that we're doing the approach, what typically will happen is you guys have written the question first, so that's why I've listed this first, and then you're bringing in the materials. Okay? Yeah. So let's read through this. It says questions can, somebody read the first one for me so it's not on my Questions voice. can be based on the interests of the children or knowledge of the teacher. Questions often emerge organically from conversation with children and interaction with the learning environment and new materials. Stop. Do you agree with that? Yes. They just come out, what do I mean by organically? Questions come out organically. What does that mean? It's a naturally. Natural. 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 Yeah. Natural. Natural. <laughs> Very good. No creative <laughs> curriculum or whatever. It's yeah, just yes. natural. It's a natural process. Very good. Yep. Okay. Keep going. The question should spark the curiosity of the teacher and the child. Okay, questions stop there for a second. Did you, did you hear that? The question should spark the curiosity. So this is going to be something that you enjoy too. It can't be something that you despise or hate because you're going to be spending some time on it, okay? It's going to be something that you would maybe enjoy. Keep going. Questions should be recorded by the group in, in the individual learning journals. Note. Although many of these questions can be answered through internet research, it is important to give the children the opportunity to opportunity to experience the scientific process so they can so they have an opportunity to practice solving problems through creative thinking some questions work better for the process than others okay so could you guys answer these questions by just going on the internet mm -hmm. no a lot of times I, yes yeah, yeah. 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 But, some of them like yeah. okay i had an example uh it is on it's in your powerpoint it's on ants Okay, so here's mine. Okay, so basically, and what I'm showing you is this whole process is basically based off of the scientific method. Do you guys know the scientific method? The scientific method is something that's used all over the world for pro solving problems. It's probably this thing that you learned in third grade and just kind of forgot. Okay? <laughs> but here's how the scientific method works. And it's pretty much, I think, how life works. Okay. Part one, ask a question. Why is my husband such a jerk? <laughs> Why is school so difficult? You know? Why am I fat? Whatever it is. Okay. So ask a question, okay? Then what's the second thing you do? Do background, do background research. And we all do this, right? Yes. Why is my best friend so mean? We do bit well, well, she's mean to other people and gosh, I'm eating too many ice cream cones. All right. So we do research, we start figuring stuff out. Okay? Then the third thing is we come up with a hypothesis. My guess is maybe I'm fat because I don't eat enough vegetables. All right? So then we do an experiment. What's the experiment? We eat more vegetables, we eat more vegetables right? <laughs> and what happens? Sometimes it works and we get thinner and we think Exercise. That's it. It's exercise and vegetables, and that's going to make a difference in my life. We analyze the data. Did I lose weight? Did I not lose weight? Is my husband still being a jerk? What's going on, right? We write it down, don't we? Or we shouldn't we? Okay. And then let's say we communicate. Oh, my gosh, I lost weight on this diet. Or I, I stopped yelling at my husband and started writing him little love notes, and now he's nice to me, right? We do this, don't we? You think about this. This is a very natural process. It's what we do all the time. And it's what really effective people do all the time in their lives with your business. How many times have you had problems in your business? Not every time. <laughs> all right. And so, and you've had to come up with solutions. Of course. The budget's not working. This particular lead teacher's not doing their job. These women are fighting and bickering with each other all the time. You come up with a solution, right? Yes. You offer that solution to the center. Sometimes it works. Sometimes, Sometimes it, doesn't it doesn't work, right? Back to the drawing board. Try again. Really effective leaders do this all the time, but they're conscious of the process. They're realizing what they're doing, and they're making decisions. So when you fail, let's say that, that you try something, it doesn't work. Start what do you? Start over again. Start over again. But learn. Learn, learn. absolutely. Learn from the failure. Do you know one of the most important concepts I'm trying to teach my kids, and what and I'd love to teach you guys, is that you have to fail forward. What does that mean, to fail forward? You fail, but you keep moving forward. You fail, fail but you, you pause. People. You say to yourself, what went wrong? Mm -hmm. Why didn't this work? What happened here? You think really hard about that, and you make sure that you don't do it again. That's failing forward. And those failures are more important than the successes. Because a lot of That's times true. with the successes, they don't, we don't stop. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We don't, we don't internalize them. We're just like, oh, that works good. So on to the next thing. Because we got 25 things waiting to go. Right? And I want to get to bed before midnight. But the failures are what really force us to pause and say, 
oh, I got to try something again. And what happens is if we let the failure discourage us, we limit our effectiveness. But when we've learned, okay, didn't work out so great. Back to my original question. Like time that. to try something new. Time to move on. That's how we become incredibly effective people. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use the scientific method. And when it, when I hit the time, but how, what, how much time am I at? You're at 10, 20, 60. Oh, we're fine. Okay. When we use the scientific process with kids, we teach them this very early in their lives which helps them think about Sir Ken Robinson, to be creative thinkers, to be innovative, to be problem solvers, to realize if they write stuff down, if they think about it, if they design experiments, if it fails, if they try again, they can do anything. They can solve any kind of problem. All right? So it doesn't mean we rush over to YouTube or the internet or Google or a book and we say, okay, here's the answer. Mm -hmm. Because, gosh, the answers are all out there, but it's what we do with those answers that's going to define our success in the future. Okay? So here's my question. Maybe I'm listening to the kids and they're all, what happens in the early spring? You know, all of a sudden the ants come out, right? Isn't that a big deal on the playground, on the preschool playground? And some little one discovers an ant hill. And holy cow, <laughs> right? Those ants are spilling and they're scurrying and it's huge and they're, ew, and somebody's screaming bloody murder, usually a girl, and she hates the ants and one of the boys are trying to step on them as hard as they can and squish them all, right? Right? And somebody's got their eyeglasses out and they're trying to burn all the ants, but we're fascinated by ants, right? So somehow in listening to this conversation, the kids talking about the ants, they're, they're, they're saying this, how do ants talk to each other, teacher? Or maybe Johnny says, oh, look at those ants. You think they're talking? Can, they, can the ants talk? Okay, so there's the question, and it emerges. We're not sure how it emerges, but a question comes out and it emerges. So now we've got to do some background research. Now, can you see how these could, this could go either way? Like, we could just bring in the ant stuff before the questions came up, and then the questions, okay, hit stop. 